Hey guys, really sorry for keeping you waiting. Uh, our talk today is about hacking autonomous trucks, and apparently we should have thought more about hacking our calendars and not thinking our talk was tomorrow. Um, so really, really apologize. Alexi and the team have been great in getting us set up, uh, and this is completely on us. Um, so we're Starsky Robotics, and what we came out of stealth last Tuesday as a driverless truck startup that's already moved freight on the highway. Um, I wasn't in the 2004 DARPA Grand Challenge. I am not a, an alumni of Google X. Uh, we didn't go to Stanford. Um, by all means, we're not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to be a driverless truck startup. We're not supposed to have done this. And the reason that we've gotten this done so quickly, out of nowhere, the reason a lot of you guys have never heard of us before, is because we've basically hacked our way to doing this. Uh, we didn't, George Hotz, hack a, hack a data port to get this done. We took this incredibly hard problem uh, that really smart people have described as being a 10-year, $100 million type of issue to do, and we've broken it down into something where almost everything we've built, we've built since, since I'd say, last, last June. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the other things uh, that I want to point out is uh, I came from uh, another startup uh, before, before joining Starsky, and uh, well, as you, can, as you can see, it didn't work out that well for me uh, for, with my previous startup. And uh, one of the biggest takeaways from it was the value of a minimum viable product. And we actually, I actually carried that with me in, into this one. Uh, and you can see that by looking at exactly how we implemented the technology. And, uh, and to, to cut Kartik off, to describe his last startup, does anyone here like robots <laughs> at all? <laughs> All right, cool, good crowd. So Kartik's last startup, Updroid, we're building really, really cool consumer robots. So it was a modular robot with a, and you could pop on a set of wheels, you could swap out sensor kits, well, whether it have cameras, whether it have radar, different actuators, does it have one arm, does it have two, maybe you take off the wheels and put a series of legs, uh, all on a custom chip set that makes it really easy to do all of these things. And that's really neat. Uh, but they sure as hell burnt through their $700,000 of funding and didn't sell anything. Um, because while that would be great five, ten years from now after multiple uh, Kickstarter campaigns and multiple early iterations, to launch that as your first product is really hard. Similarly, the first start that I worked for was a privacy-centered social network where you could own your own content, sell it to others using their digital currency, and to top it all off, they had a nonprofit to protect your social network data. Uh, maximum day, they had 50 active users and 80 employees. Um, MVP is pretty key to how we've thought about this, and we think that trucking is the minimal, minimal viable product for the autonomous industry. Yeah, and also not just trucking, but the way we are approaching trucking is, uh, is more or less the way we think is, uh, which is, I mean, it is the MVP of uh, self-driving technology as such. Uh, what, uh, just to go into a little more detail about how, uh, how we did this, we looked at the trucking industry, and Stefan can talk, about, uh, talk more about the business aspect of it, but uh, as the problem came to me, all we had to do was build a lane-keeping uh, build a lane keeping uh, vehicle that can also do adaptive cruise control. Uh, and we, we, would, we, we would already be in business. So, uh, yeah. So... What's, what's hard about self-driving? Um, being a self-driving car in San Francisco, being cruise, being Uber for two days in December, um, is really difficult. There's a homeless person staggering into the street here. There's a couple of hipsters uh, uh, walking across, jaywalking over there. It's a really complicated, weird problem. Um, trucking is a different space. So we didn't, come out, we didn't make a good algorithm and decide what's a good use case, maybe trucking. We thought about trucking first. So many of you guys probably don't know this. There is a severe truck driver shortage in America. The reason for that is it's really, really hard to get human beings to spend a month at a time in a truck. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to live in a truck, get home one day a month, uh, without a high school diploma, you make sixty dollars to $90,000 a year. And there's a shortage of 50,000 drivers. So the problem in trucking is not how great of a math problem can we solve. The problem is, can we make a truck move? Um, to make a truck move, it doesn't need to be autonomous 100% of the time. To make a truck move, it needs to move. 
um, if you are building something that addresses this space without actually removing the person from the truck, you're not solving the problem. You don't have a product. You're doing nothing, which is why we're doing what we're doing, remote control from a distribution center to a highway, autonomous on the highway, and then remote control to another distribution center. Long haul driving is distribution center to distribution center. At each end, it's no more than five miles away from the highway. We effectively have made a driverless truck without ever needing to deal with how do we stop if a kid chases a bouncy red ball into the middle of the street. And by definition, warehouse districts uh, in general are not, uh, not similar to uh, neighborhoods in San Francisco. So you already eliminate a lot of ed edge cases. And because you already are building the whole technology on top of uh, teleoperation as, as its basic, uh, as its basic com component, you already have uh, a sense of supervision that uh, any, any, any person in our command station can provide. Uh, so that's, that's the essence of the whole technology pl platform. Uh, the other thing is, uh, which sort of goes in, in, into a political, uh, uh, po political scenario, which is we also have uh, human in the loop. Uh, so we do think that uh, all, like all the technology advances that, uh, that can happen in the next two to three years uh, might make a fully autonomous level five uh, vehicle uh, possible. But we as a startup cannot wait for, for, for that to happen. We don't have 100 million years. We don't we, have 10, we don't, we, uh, we don't have 100 million dollars. We don't have 10 years. We need to build something real. We need to build something now or we need to get jobs. And we need a lot of data to build that level five car, uh, level, level, level five vehicle. Uh, to gather a lot of data, we need vehicles on the road. And we go in, into this vicious cycle of what, or sorry, chicken and egg problem, well, what comes first. We, uh, so we, Waymo, yeah, we, we have already put vehicles on the road now, and we are have, we have already gathering data while also doing business. Waymo's spent a fortune driving in circles in Mountain View over the last seven, eight years, um, and we also need to drive in circles. Um, since we're a self-driving truck, we should be driving in circles with some level of weight in the back of the vehicle to, to actually simulate what it's like at different weights. An, an unloaded tractor trailer is about 20,000 pounds. A fully loaded tractor tra trailer is about 80,000 pounds. So there's, there's a lot of dynamics to learn there. Um, if we're gonna be driving in circles with weight, we might as well get paid for it which all of a sudden allows us to have the same testing footprint as, as an auto, as a much larger company. Mid next month, we should have six to eight testing vehicles continuously gathering data for us, which gives us one of the largest fleets in self-driving, despite most of you guys never having heard of us before last week. Uh, the other interesting thing about our approach is uh, uh, we are not using any technology uh, or any product that has not existed, or the, uh, or the shell that has not existed for uh, in the market for the for the last five years. Uh, so, which is we, a nice way of saying we're not using lidar. <laughs> um, uh, I've gotten cornered at parties about how how dare Tesla, how dare Comma.ai not use lidar. Everyone else uses it. Uh, it's pretty telling that the one company really in market isn't using lidar. Um, it's a really cool sensor. It's spinning lasers. That's awesome. I would love some spinning lasers. Um, the reality of it is that there are very few LIDARs that have been built that functionally operate at highway speed. Um, I've heard numbers that there's 500 to 600 of them. They're hard to get a hold of. Um, if we were waiting on magic LIDARs to show up, we'd be waiting to build self-driving trucks for a long time. And 4,000 people die each year in truck accidents. There's a moral imperative to bring safe technology to market and I'm not gonna wait for the LiDAR companies to get their act together. Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's uh, our unprepared talk <laughs> for, for today. <laughs> and I'm sure we'd be happy to take as many questions as you guys have. Um, yeah. Let me grab the mic here for you guys. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you mentioned that you guys are going to have remote control uh, from the warehouse to the highway merge zone. What kind of communication protocol are you going to use for that? Secret sauce. <laughs> um, I'll be yeah, this is a me. brutal uh, industry. Uh, we'll have some stories coming out later this year about how shitty human beings have been in this industry in the last year <laughs> and a half. So that is secret sauce. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, and one more. I'm very curious. Um, 
I, I noticed you guys took an approach of attaching your own actuators to the steering wheel yeah. and to the pedals. Um, one, why did you take that approach? And two, how does that impact driver takeovers? Yeah, so our system, uh, not on, uh, but with the whole system in the way, um, as you might be getting at, uh, has been driven across the country multiple times. Um, so it, it, it doesn't have an impact so far that we've noticed on driver control of the vehicle. Um, the reason for actuators as opposed to going into the data port. Uh, so when I first started working on this in September of 2015, um, I started emailing some like R&D labs for some giant OEMs that I'm sure some of the richer ones of you own vehicles from. And I said, hey, uh, how hard would it be for us to just get access to your open API, start issuing commands to your trucks, la la li li, we have a self-driving truck. Uh, and the response I got was, well, three to five years from us, uh, and I'd say a similar amount of time from all of our tier two and tier three suppliers. So at that point, the thought became either we wait three to five years, which we don't have, because we don't have three to five years of personal runway, um, or we hack the truck, um, or we actually just push pedals. Uh, there's about 100 years of engineering thought and experience on how to reliably push a pedal, on how to reliably turn a wheel. Uh, that, and trucks, unlike retrofit kits for Audis, don't need to look pretty. Um, they need to be reliable, they need to be safe. So that's why we are physically and manually actuating the truck as opposed to hacking into the data port and possibly compromising any of the safety critical systems. It is also a, a single uh, point of failure. Uh, if something goes wrong, we can actually backtrace everything uh, to either our, our system or to either the truck. Uh, there, are, like, mul like, there are multiple uh, answers to that question. So if we're going in through the data port uh, and the window's down and a splash of water lands just magically right, uh, which at scale will happen, uh, the data port fries out and you no longer have control over your self-driving truck on the highway. That's pretty terrifying. Um, that's one point. One of our, one of our investors is uh, Blake Scholl from Boom Aerospace, and we've been very much thinking about safety for autonomous vehicles in the same light and the same standards as uh, safety for, for aerospace. Um, so everything that we build has to have multiple redundant ways to, to safely operate the vehicle. It's a lot easier to do that through mechanical actuators pushing pedals than it is through a single data port. It is also a different, uh, different uh, set of th thought process when you uh, look at the problem from uh, deploying it as a business rather than being a science experiment. Uh, big, like saf safety does come first when you think of, of scalability and uh, think of deploying these trucks on actual public roads where other people are driving and how, what happens when uh, nobody is in the truck and something bad happens. Uh, so. We, that's, that's why we actually take, uh, take air, like airline safety as our, sta as our gold standard and maybe ho like, and hopefully surpass that. That's, that'll be our uh, target. Cool. Uh, probably have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Anybody? Oh, we got one over here. Hold on. Has to be on the opposite side of the room. <laughs> So with the remote control um, aspect, um, what actually happens if uh, you lose communication with one of the vehicles, whether it's um, someone yeah. attacking it or whether, I don't know, cell towers go down or whatever technology you're using? Yep. So um, as far as hacking, there's been some clever stuff we're doing over there, um, which is a, a, nice, a nice cheap answer. Um, but as far as communication going down, it is, it is very far from black magic uh, to make a self-driving vehicle pull itself over on the side of the road. Um, there's a decent amount of precedent for that, so uh, while working on this, we've learned a lot of ways about how the trucking industry in general is incredibly messed up and, 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 and people are incentivized to drive unsafely. Uh, truck drivers can drive about 11 hours um, per day, uh, be on duty for 14, and when they're approaching that, that, that limit, they have to pull over and park somewhere. But there's an interesting problem when you get to rest stops, there's limited truck parking. So frequently drivers will have to keep on driving past their legal and safe hours of service as they're falling asleep to find a parking spot, which is why so often you see trucks pull it over on the side of the highway. Is it encouraged to pull over on the side of the highway for an extended period of time? Absolutely not. Um, but it's regular enough practice that we can use it as a fallback position should communication get cut. 
Um, another way we're effectively able to, to hack and, and severely minimize the problem that we're, we're, we're going after is by only working with partners who need their trucks to go in certain places. So similarly, how do we deal in snow? Well, right now, we're not working with trucking companies who want to drive places where it snows. Um, how do we deal with communication in tunnels? Well, right now, we don't drive through tunnels. Um, that is not a good answer for when we have 3,000 trucks on the road. Um, but we're a ways away from that. And that we're solving the, the problems to, to get to market now. OK. Thank you, guys.